out. So today, how many of you all are ready for the word? Amen. Good. I think I'm. I think I might be at the right place. So, uh, so today, my goal is to challenge you. My goal is uh, that we can gain some new perspective um, and some new uh, new ideas around God's word. And I'll give you the title of the message today, right off the top. The name of the or the title of the message is Name Associations. Name Associations. Um, today, I want us to evaluate our. Uh, things that we associate ourselves with. At, from a very young age, I had a, I had a struggle with this. I I would associate myself with certain people, uh, and I and I and I put whatever value on myself of all according to the, to the attention that these people, these specific individuals, gave me. If they gave me the attention that I wanted, then I then I felt a certain way that I wanted to. And that's a struggle that young people can have as they gain their identity, as they're as they're in this formative stage. But even as adults, I found and and I could imagine that that that's something that we all. Uh, need to navigate is, is what we associate with, where do we find our value, and, and these sorts of things. So today, um, I want to read a scripture from start to finish. We're in our uh, series, what is it, week 16 of uh, an eight-week series of the book of Acts. Can I hear a whoop-whoop for the book of Acts? So I want to read our scripture, uh, I want to work our way through it, and I want to take a good look at ourselves to wrap up. If you have your Bibles, uh, why don't you lift up, lift up your Bibles if you got them here in the place. Lift them up, wave them like you just do care. Come on, somebody. Uh, if you have them on your iPad, that's okay. I heard, I heard a preacher say, right? We can always listen to what preachers say, right? I heard a preacher say that if you bring your paper Bible to church, you get front row seats in heaven. Just know that. Just know that. Just know that. No, whether your Bible, uh, you, whether you flip it or turn it on, turn to uh, Acts chapter 19, and we are going to get into God's word this morning. I'm super excited. Name Associations is uh, the title of the message today. We are going to look at Acts chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse one, verses 1 through 20. Crazy story of Paul in Ephesus. Paul in Ephesus. Uh, we're going we're gonna to dive right in, and then we're going we're gonna to pray. How's that sound? Does that sound good with you all? Do I got some Jesus people? Do I got some, some Bible people here? We're going to look at this. So the story of Paul in Ephesus goes like this. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and, became, and came to Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, this is so interesting, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into then what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who, is, who was to come and after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They began speaking in tongues, prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Uh, and then skipping down to verse 11, uh, it reads this, and God was doing extraordinary miracles. Somebody say extraordinary miracle by the hands of Paul. So that even the handkerchiefs or the aprons that touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. And the evil spirits came out of them. And some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, undertook and invoked the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva. Somebody say Sceva. That's an interesting name. You don't see that on babiesnames.com these days, but interesting. Uh, uh, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirits answered him. Uh, this, is, this is wild. We're going we're gonna to jump right into this. Uh, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit uh, was in leaped on them, mastering all. And of them overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon all of them. And the name of the Lord was greatly extolled. Are you still with me? Verse 18 says, And also many of those who were 
who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to come to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Somebody say prevail mightily. So this is such an interesting story of Paul in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is very significant in you, in your and my history, in church's history. Paul spent some of the most time there uh, during his ministry. This was a stronghold of darkness, but it later became a stronghold for the gospel. Amen? No place is too hard for God. Uh, Ten years later, he writes a book to these people that we know as Ephesians. And, uh, and Ephesians is such, such, such a powerful story, and we're going to look at it. But first, let's pray, and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to, to bless and anoint this time. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, I ask that, that you would bring about a, an encouraging word today. I pray that you would strengthen us in your love. I pray that you would help us to see what we are called from and help us to see what we are called into Father, I thank you that we, uh, that we are uh, your sheep, and we hear your voice, we know your voice, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 So, one of my favorite games to play while I'm driving down the road, um, me and my wife, we love to play it, uh, whether we're on long road trips or whatever the case may be, we turn on the radio, and us as young people, we never listen to the radio anymore, so that's like a, a novelty for us. Hey, let's turn on the radio. And we like to scan through the radio, and we like to name whatever song comes through. Sometimes if it lands on a station Angel listens to, she gets them every time. If it lands on a hip-hop station or something like that, I feel like I can name all the, all the, all the artists and angels left in the dark. But, but that's a game that we like to do. We like to play Name That Tune. You guys ever play that going down the road when you're trying to name the artist or name the song? Um, and I, I love doing that, but... There's, there's certain stations that Angel enjoys, and there's certain stations and genres that I enjoy. I can name them all on certain stations. But the thing about uh, being able to name a song, the thing about being able to name an artist is just because you can name an artist doesn't mean that you know the artist. doesn't mean that you know the author. And just because one can name the name of Jesus doesn't mean that they're living out the relationship that he has called us to. Today, we're going to look at a couple of different people. We're going to look at the associations that they had, the, the names that they used in their lives, the names that they associated themselves with, and what happened to them, and ultimately, what happened through them. Okay? Are you guys with me this morning? Yeah. All right. So I believe today's message is something that the world needs, but I believe this is something that, that this is uh, a message that we all need individually. Um, I believe that we're going to be challenged today, that we're going to be, that we're going to be encouraged. So in Acts chapter 9, we're, there's a couple of different sections that we're just going to work our way through today. This, this chapter is so rich and, and can teach us more than I have time to say today, but, but bear with us. We're going to, we're going to work our way through this. And in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul meets other disciples. And I think this is so interesting that Paul's first question when he meets these people was, have you received the Holy Spirit when you first believed? I feel like that might be an interesting conversation starter at the, at the gas station or at the, uh, at the cash register. Such, a, such an interesting question just to ask somebody. And, and their response to me is even more interesting. The Bible says that they responded by saying, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And, and upon reading this, um, it's, it's so interesting. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, have you, have you seen this movie? you got to see this movie. Have you seen this movie? And you're like, I haven't even, I, don't, I, don't even, I haven't even heard of that movie. Is that Avengers 7? Or is that like, I haven't, I haven't even heard of this movie that you're telling me that I have to see. How is that? And this is years and years and years after the Holy Spirit has been poured out in the book of Acts that we read. How can these people not, not know that there even is a Holy Spirit? And upon reading this, upon looking into some studies... Uh, you, some scholars believe, uh, as we look a little bit closer, that they only received John's baptism, meaning they were disciples of John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus. You see, John's message was important in its time. It pointed to Jesus, but it did not take men there itself. So, you can imagine these Ephesian disciples, they heard something, they heard about the coming Messiah through John's message, and they needed to be ready, but they haven't heard that the Messiah had in fact come. 
So, so they were ready, but they didn't know they needed to trust in his specific person or his specific work. All that to say is that these Ephesian disciples, a lot of scholars believe that they weren't even Christians yet. They were followers of John the Baptist, but they didn't quite know about Jesus. So they were disciples. Everybody say disciples, but not of Jesus. And when you think about it, it's very, very simple. If you're taking notes, you can write this statement down. It says, we get to decide what we are a disciple of. We get to decide what we are a disciple of. A lot of people today are disciples of the culture. A lot of people are disciples of finances. A lot of people are disciples of their friends. And this is interesting as well. The Lord uh, just dropped this in my heart. A lot of people in the world today are disciples of more than being disciples of Jesus. They're disciples of church. And you might be asking, what even is a disciple of church? And I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'm glad you asked because first off, it gives me an opportunity to say how much I love the local church. I believe the local church is is the hope of the world. I believe that gatherings of people, whether they're in a building like this or a living room, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I love everything about church. I love showing up. I love love hugging on people. I love being together. Um, But I, uh, I know that external behaviors, rhythms, and weekly routines can never do for us what revelation, relationship with a man, Jesus, can do for us. Amen? Which is transform us from the inside out. God never wants us to simply adopt rhythms and behaviors and routines. He wants to transform us and change us from the inside out. Amen? So, so these, these men weren't immoral. They were just associated. They were just associated with this person, John the Baptist, rather than being a disciple of Jesus. And, and, and it wasn't a bad thing to even be associated with John the Baptist. He was, he was Jesus' cousin, in, in, in a matter of fact. He, could look up, he would look over to Jesus across the dinner table, and he would say, what up, cuz? And Jesus would be like, what up, cuz? These guys were cousins. So it wasn't even a, a bad thing that they were associated with, but it just wasn't the right thing in the right time. We get to decide what we are a disciple of. Are we going to be a disciple of the true Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be a disciple of politics, a disciple of culture? And it may not even be a wrong thing that we're giving ourselves to, but is it the true Lord Jesus that we are giving ourselves to, letting, us, letting it change us our, in everything that we do? And here's the thing about what we get to choose what disciples us. They were only associated with God. Um, And when we're only associated with God, we miss out on the power and the presence of God. Somebody say power. Power. Somebody say presence. presence. You see, God has power that works in us, and God has power that works out of us. Amen? Whenever we're just associated with, with church activities, which are, which are great. I love church activities. I'm on a team help planning church activities. When we're just associated with these things, we miss out on the power and the presence that God has for us as individuals. God's grace uh, is, is his power, and God's grace works both inside of us to help, re- to help redeem some of, the, some of the sinful things about ourselves, some of the things that he's wanting to, to put off of us, and God's grace works through us so that we can be a conduit of God's power. We don't get to be a conduit of God's power if we're just associated with church. But whenever we adopt uh, this, this m- new mindset of being a true disciple of Jesus rather than church activities— uh, we, we receive God's power to work in us and to work through us. And the truth I know about God is that he always wants to take us deeper. Somebody say deeper. Here's a quote uh, that I found today, or that I found this week for, for us today. It says, God always wants to go deeper. We tend to sip where we could drink deeply. We tend to drink deeply where we can wade in. And we wade in where we could plunge in and swim. Most of us need to be encouraged to go deeper and farther into the things of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The truth about God is that you can have as much of God as you want. As well, you you can have as much of God as you want, but you can only have as much as you want. 
God's not, a, God's not a man that he would force himself on you, that he would cause you to fall down on the ground and, and have this crazy experience that you're not ready for. But you can have as much of God as you want in your daily life, at your coffee table, at your, in, your, in your bedroom when you wake up and go to sleep, in your car. You can have as much of God as, as you want. And I have to give to these disciples. They had the right heart, but they were just associated with the wrong name. And, and they were ready and open to receive Jesus. I got to give credit to Tiffany Baraboo. I'm not sure if she's watching. She, was, she served with us here at Lighthouse for a time. She said this, and it stuck with me, and I believe it'll, it'll stick with me for a long time. I heard from her uh, that she doesn't refer to people as believers and unbelievers. Uh, she refers to them as believers and pre-believers. <laughs> Everybody, there's a whole lot of pre-believers out there, amen? These people, they, they, they had the right heart. Uh, but they were just associated with the, with, the, with the wrong name. And Paul came to them, spoke with them, was bold enough to speak with them, and had a transformation uh, experience. I love that. I love that. And then you go on in, in, in Acts chapter 19, and you look at some of the unusual things that were happening. You can look in Acts chapter 19, verses 11. It says that God was doing extraordinary miracles. Some versions say unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that he had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them. Some evil spirits came out of them. I think that is, that is so, so crazy. And earlier in the book of Acts, we read about how Peter's shadow heals people, how he walked by people and, and his shadow healed people. I, I had this total random thought this week. I, I said, I wonder if whenever the sun was completely above him and it was like noon, if like nobody got healed and like whenever it was sunset or sun, like everybody to the left of him got healed and in sunset, everybody on the right of him got healed. I don't, I don't know how it was, but but maybe it was just because the, the anointing that was on him, he got so close to him. But God was doing unusual things in this time. People were taking his aprons, his handkerchiefs, and, and spreading them throughout the, the region, and people were getting healed. If, if I sneezed, and, and you and I sneezed into a handkerchief and spread it all over south of the river, probably the only thing people would get would be COVID. <laughs> but, but Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons, they were spreading them, and God was doing these amazing things. It was so crazy. Uh, so... Uh, Here's the thing, uh, that, was, that was what I like to call some holy laundry. <laughs> some of you guys out there, your wife do laundry and say that you have some holy laundry, but that's for a completely different reason. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> here's, what I need, here's what I need you to know about this, is that God, it says that God worked these unusual miracles, not Paul. You see, God works miracles, not us, amen? Amen. So there's no command in these scriptures for us to, to sneeze into a handkerchief and spread it around or to wave it over anybody's head. We're called to lay hands on the sick, and, and by faith, by God's grace, they are healed. Amen? God was working these extraordinary things. And, and I, I want you to know to not get caught up by replicating the past. Simply seek God now and be open to the unusual things that he wants to work now. Amen? Let God work through you. Don't try to work God. Let God work through you. Don't try to work God. And that's what you find the sons of Sceva fell into. The sons of Sceva is almost like this excerpt of these, of these, of these people, of these guys. Um, and we see in the story that uh, the sons of Sceva, say that five times fast, uh, these unusual things were, were happening, and they, and they caught wind of them, and they said, you know what might give us uh, a couple of more influence? You know what might be able to make us some more money, what might be able to get us some more clout, what might be able to get some new members, or, or whatever, their, whatever their motives were? They said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take what's, what God is doing over here, and we're going to try to replicate it ourselves. You see, these people, they were using the right name, but they had the wrong heart. They were using the right name, and they had the right heart. The Bible doesn't even talk about them being Christians or disciples of the way. They simply wanted to replicate the, word, the work of God. And more than being a disciple of Jesus, they were too busy. They were too busy being associated with the ministry. And ministry, you can write this down if you'd like, ministry is not a method to be replicated. It is a man that we should have a relationship with, and his name is Jesus. Whenever we come here on a Sunday morning and we're getting ministered to and we feel the presence or we feel the anointing, that is Jesus. 
whether it's Tom Scarella or Bill Goodwin or Paul or Evelyn or whoever stands in this pulpit, whenever we receive revelation and whenever we receive that peace of God, that, 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 that rest for our souls, that is not a man, that is Jesus that we're experiencing too. And whenever we're praying over somebody or whenever we get a, a random thought and somebody comes up and shares a dream or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or an exhortation for us here at Lighthouse, that's not the person, that's Jesus wanting to speak to you. How many of you all are ready for what Jesus wants to speak to you in your life? Amen. Amen. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Ministry is not a, not a method to be replicated, but it's a man that we should have a relationship with. So uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it won't be on the screen, but you see how the disciples, uh, they came back from their missionary journeys, and they were casting out demons, and they were doing these things that maybe even the sons of Sceva wanted to do. And they said, Jesus, these, these demons, they, they, they listened to us. It was so crazy. They were recounting all the stories. But Jesus says, he said, guys, 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 come here, come here, come here. I don't want you to be excited about the, the works that are coming out of your hands, I want you to be more excited that your name is in the Lamb's book of life and you're my son and you're my children. Because if you get excited about the external work, you're going to miss out on the internal work that I have on the inside of you. Super important that we realize this today. That ministry is not something that we should replicate, but it's a man that we should have a relationship with. And I want to check out uh, what happens after this. After the Sons of Sceva takes place and after these, these men who try to simply just replicate what God was doing, they tried to, uh, to operate in a, in a level of authority that they did not have. They tried to do things that they had no business doing. These men, uh, everybody and their mother heard about it, it said. Everybody heard about this embarrassing time. Everybody heard about this, this, this situation with the sons of Sceva. And when they heard about it, they gave more glory to God's name than before. In our world today, you see a lot of pastors fall and you see a lot of scandals. And I feel like almost every time you turn on the news, there's a, there's a leader that's doing something wrong. It's so It's such God's character that even in the midst of people's failure, Jesus' name is lifted up. Jesus' name is always going to be lifted up no matter uh, human frailties. And these people had a realization. They had a realization of, of these books and these charms and these trinkets that they had in their home was tied to these spiritual powers that they didn't want to have anything to do with. In verse, in verse 18 of, of chapter 19, it says, Also, many of those believers who were, now, who were new believers, they came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. You see, sometimes us as believers, we receive a new name, but we still have old associations. Sometimes we, we, we have a new name, but we have old associations. And, and what do we do with these associations? What do we do? Sometimes whenever, whenever we become a Christian, I think the, the main thing that Jesus wants to speak to us is of identity, Sometimes, sometimes God just speaks that over me in different seasons over and over and over again so that I can be rooted in my identity because oftentimes when I find myself struggling in certain areas or certain spaces, it's because I, I feel more comfortable doing the things that I once did rather than walking in a new way. But if I, see myself in a, if I see myself as a righteous son of God, as pure, as holy, which is the most true thing about me, says Jesus, then I will walk in a brand new way. But it's so often to have a new name but old associations. It pains me uh, that, that people walk in this and, and, and can't get set free of this because there is, there is power between you and a trusted friend, a trusted believer. There's power in confession. There's power in bringing things out into the open. There's power in, in speaking to your spouse, speaking to your husband or your wife or your, or your trusted friend about something that you're going through because you're... you're your secrets only have power as long as they stay in the dark. But as they come into the light, God can shine on it, and, and he never shines on us to expose us or, or, to, or, to, or to shame us, but as we bring it into the light, that's the only way that it can be healed. There's power in confession. There's power in divulging. You see here in Acts chapter 19, these people, they didn't keep their secret trinkets in their house. They didn't bury them deeper in the closet. They brought them out for everyone to see. 
it pains me. It really, really pains me to know that there are some communities of faith, some traditions of faith that have taken this art of confession and, and put it into a systemic, put it into a system uh, that, of works that you have to do this so that you can be forgiven of your sin. I want you to know today that if you're in Christ, you're forgiven of your sin. Amen. Can I get an Amen. If you're in Christ, you're forgiven of your sin, but there is a freedom and there is a loosening of bondage whenever we confess our sins to one another. And this is what you see happen. In James chapter, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says that if we confess our sins, when we confess our sins to brothers uh, and sisters in Christ, there's power in whenever we get to pray for one another. Sometimes in our groups, we don't know what to pray for because nobody shares. But what if we had the courage enough to share what's really going on would inspire somebody else to share what's going on? And there can be more freedom that can happen in our communities. Amen? Amen. There's power in confession. And these, these they... They brought these books out, and, and it says that it was $50,000, 50,000 pieces of silver. And I thought about it, and Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was sold for some pieces of silver. How much would that? I Googled it. It was up to like $1 to $5 million worth of, of trinkets, of, 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 of booklets, of all of these things, amulets, all of these, all of these instruments that people would use to practice other spiritual powers. And they brought them out into the open, and it's so interesting. In, throughout history, you hear about dictators or different things, burning, burning books in the streets or different things like that. And, and, and people burn books because they don't want the generations after them to read them. They don't want the record of what happened to be read by the next generation. And this is, this is what the Lord was speaking to me whenever it comes to these generations in Acts chapter 9 burning books, is that they wanted to cut the generational ties of this dark spiritual power to reach, to reach their kids. No matter how good you hide things, your kids are going to find them in the closet. <laughs> no matter how deep of the cross base you have, no matter how tall the attic is, if you hide the, the sharp knife, your toddler is going to find it. And, uh, and this is what they realized. They said, I don't want to hide this anymore. I don't want to put this, bury this down deeper. I want to bring this out to the open, and I want to deal with it so that my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids will never have to deal with the bondages that I'm dealing with. I want to be free, and I want my kids to be free. How many of you, how many of you want to be free, and you want your kids, your grandkids, and your generations to be free? Amen? God's calling, us, God's calling us to be people who draw the line in the sand and say, no more of this sin, this struggle, this, this bondage in my life, and no more in my kids, no more in my kids' life. Amen? Amen. So they burn their books in the streets. They, uh, they, and after this, we didn't read this, but this is, a, this is a bonus tip for you. In Acts chapter 19, after verse 20, there's an interesting thing that begins to take place. Like the gospel, we're in Acts chapter 19, by the way. This is Paul's, uh, into Paul's missionary journeys that he was taking. And, uh, and people were beginning to uh, feel, feel the hit of, of what was happening in the culture. The gospel was taking root and people were be, becoming saved and, 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 and the culture and the landscape was changing. People who made a business out of making statues and making idols and making these trinkets, they were beginning to go out of business, the Bible says. They were going out of business because, uh, because people just simply stopped buying, stopped buying these, these, these religious, these fake idols to put in their uh, house and to worship. They stopped buying them because they were worshiping the true Lord Jesus Christ. There's a story of the Welsh Revival. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of or know of or even just heard somebody share about the Welsh Revival. The Welsh Revival happened in the early 1900s, and it was a, a revival that took place in Wales and England, and it was a miraculous time of the Spirit moving, not just in a church, but across like a whole geographical region. And the Lord's presence was, was poured out. There was eye, eyewitness records of God's presence being felt in the streets. There was like a hush, a hush in, in, in places, in public spaces, because there was such peace. People would curse and use obscene, obscene language, and they would instantly feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and people would be out and about, like, apologizing for their sins. The craziest thing about the Welsh Revival is that, is that bars and saloons were going out of business because people, people weren't drinking. People weren't going there for social, social hour. They were going to church, and they 
were going to worship. Horse tracks, where people would go and gamble their money away, they were totally closed down because nobody was there to, to provide business. When God's spirit moves, it changes the landscape around us. God doesn't want to relegate that to the past, but I believe there's a revival coming that's going to change our landscape. Am I in a place, am I with anybody who believes that as well? Kingdom disruptions. Kingdom disruptions. Paul's goal wasn't to be anti this or anti that or, or to, he didn't pick it outside of, of businesses to see them shut down. He simply believed and lived out the gospel. Whenever we believe and live out the gospel, there, is, there are repercussions. There are tidal waves that take place when groups of people, when people can come together under the name that is Jesus and see his spirit move in a geographical area. It can happen across Rosemount. It can happen across Apple Valley and Egan. It can happen in your own home. When, when somebody says yes to Jesus, there is always a spiritual release. So don't, so it's so easy to look at the Welsh revival. It's so easy to look at Paul and what he was doing and to disassociate yourself from it because I'm just this. I'm just a retired person. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. I'm just a school teacher. I'm just this. But any time that you or I say yes to Jesus, there's a spiritual release. All of these people saying yes to Jesus and, and bringing forth their, their trinkets and their, and their books, there was a spiritual release like none other. It says that all of Asia heard. But whenever you and I say yes to Jesus, there can be a, a spiritual release where our kids, our, our children, our loved ones can be affected. And there can be a shift and a tidal, uh, a tidal wave of God's presence. Amen. So today, I, I, I want us to, to evaluate our associations. I, I had a thought that, that God always wants to call us deeper. God always wants to, to bring us into deeper. And you may be hearing this and like saying, okay, I, I, I know I don't want to just be associated with church and church activities. I know I don't want to just be associated with ministry. But what, can, what is God calling me into? He's calling you into his love. He's calling you deeper into his love is what he wants us to dive deeply into. I loved your word, Adam, of, of, of that dream of, of having your own perspectives and having your own reactions to the things that you see in this world. But whenever grace is released, you're able to just have this experience of love in that moment. You see that in the, in the lives of the apostles. Uh, you see it in the lives of the disciples in this chapter. And I believe the Lord has that for us today. So why don't, uh, why don't let's stand up. And Katie, why don't you uh, jump back on the, on the keys. And, and I just want to take a look at ourselves this morning and, and ask to see what the Lord has for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we just, we just honor you. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that, that your spirit moving in, in power and in might is not something that is relegated to the past, but it's something that you have for us individually here today. Father, we don't want to be associated with you by name only, but we want to be wholehearted believers of you. Father, we want to have, we don't want to just have the, the, the right heart, Lord, but be associated with things of this world. We don't want to have the, the right heart, but the wrong name, Lord. We want to have the right heart and the right name. So Lord, forgive us for the times for even the seasons of, of being distracted by many things. And I thank you that you're not one to, to shame us or to, or to bring about a, con, a condemning word to us, but you're, but you're welcoming us back. You say, turn your hearts to me. The word repent simply means to turn our hearts. And I thank you that you're a loving father that would welcome us and receive us. Father, I pray that you give us fresh eyes to see what you are doing. Lord, let us not glorify 
miracles made by man, but Lord, let us be open to what you are doing here at Lighthouse. Lord, I know that you are moving here at Lighthouse, and we say yes, and we say yes to whatever it is that you have for us. Let us be a church marked by your presence. And God, I pray that today, for those of us who may be struggling with something that may be far back in the closet rather than out in the open. Lord, I pray for the one. I pray for the five. I pray for the seven. I pray for any of us who may be holding on to a struggle or holding on to an old association. Father, I'm asking that, I'm asking that your love would come. I'm asking that your, that your convicting love would come and you would speak to us and say, you can let it go. That you can let it go. God, I pray that you would even just begin to give us courage to speak out things maybe we've never even spoken before to somebody. Maybe we've never even told our spouse. Maybe we've never even shared with that brother or sister in the Lord. Because I know that your plan for us, Jesus, is to live as free as you paid for us to be. So those old associations, those old titles, those old names that people have called us, I pray that you would just put distance in our hearts and our minds between those things. I thank you that you have separated us as far as the East is from the West from those associations, those names, those sins, those struggles. And there's nothing that can separate us there's nothing that can separate us from your heart, from our heart connection with you. So I pray that that truth would seek into, sink into our hearts today, that you would minister to us in that way today. Father, give us the courage to, to bring out those, those books. They may, they, may be, they may not be witchcraft books, but Lord, but Lord all, all sin, all struggles you see as the same. So Lord, let us bring those out. And Father, I'm asking here at this church that we would be people who draw the line in the sand of the generational addictions, the generational bondage, the generational turmoil, that we would be people that draw the line in the sand and see change come in the next generation of our family. Father, all the glory goes to you, but God, I'm asking for testimonies of, I remember when grandpa prayed over us. I remember whenever grandma prophesied over us and things in our family changed. Father, I'm, I'm thanking you that the fire of the Holy Spirit will come and will burn up these things in our lives and purify our hearts today. Jesus, we know that your gospel demands a response. We know that you're calling us into a deeper moment of your love and we want to be people who respond. Show us this week. Show us right now what you're calling us to do and give us the courage to do so. I thank you that you always call us into goodness. You always call us into more. And I pray that we would be people who won't be satisfied with just a sip, just a drink, just ankle level, but Lord, let us wade into your presence, into your river, into the things that you have for us. Let us be people who respond. As we close and as we wrap up, I just, I just feel in my heart that the, the prayer team, Alicia by Adam, anybody who's on the prayer team, why don't you guys just make yourself uh, available? You can come forward. And as we close, I just want to just be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And if there's something in your life that you just want to speak out and, and share with somebody or just receive prayer over, we have wonderful, wonderful people that will do that. Oftentimes when when the enemy wants to distract you, he'll send people your way. And when God wants to bless you, he'll send people your way. These are some wonderful people who want to bless you. You guys maybe can come on the other side as well. Who want to be a blessing to you. Want to come alongside you and, and pray for you. So if you have something that you know you need to respond with today, these are some loving people who can pray over you, your family. So let's, let's do this. Let's pray, and, and, those, and the blessing can come on the screen as well as we, as we speak that.
so we just thank you, Lord, for all that you're calling us into this week. Lord, I thank you for the book of Acts. Father, I know in, in Acts 17, the, the testimony of the people of that town say that, Lord, the peop, they, they say the people who have turned the world upside down have come here. God, I pray that that would be the testimony of our coworkers. I pray that that would be the testimony of our family, that the people, my, my friend who, who turns this office upside down, they've, they've come back to work and there's something different about them. You change everything about us. Lord, let us change things in our spheres of influence. Let us respond to what you have for us.